It's my pleasure to welcome you all to another installment of the Mind Walk series. Uh, this is a collaboration between California State Parks and the Central Coast State Parks Association. Uh, my name is Laurel. I'm an interpreter one for the Oceano Dunes District of California State Parks. And I just wanted to uh, extend my appreciation to Monica and the team at Sea Spot for putting on these awesome events. The Mind Walk Lecture Series um, seeks to connect experts in a variety of fields with the natural and cultural history of the Central Coast, and also the abundant recreational opportunities we have. The Central Coast is a main place, and we get to talk about interesting topics pertaining to those places. The Mind Walks program is underwritten by Thomas E. and Mary Catherine Eltsroff Fund, and supported, like I said, by the Central Coast State Parks Association. Each month, the Mind Walks series alternates between in-person setting like this, and also virtual Mind Walks. Uh, so those are available through Zoom, and there's an incredible archive of previous mind walks that you can explore on the Seaspall website. There will be future mind walks um, coming up in the next few months. They'll be talking about oak trees, osteology, waste management, California condors, and other subjects. The schedule can be viewed on the website here on the screen. Today's presentation will last roughly 45 minutes. There'll be time at the end for a Q&A, so if you have questions throughout, put those in your back pocket, and we'll be able to address those at the end. We'd ask that after the presentation, uh, if you all have the time to fill out a short form survey for us. Uh, your input is super important. If you have ideas for things, topics you'd like to hear about, or suggestions to improve the MindWalk series, uh, we're all ears. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, so today, it's my pleasure to introduce our, our speaker, uh, Dr. Kevin Marquez Johnson. Uh, his presentation will be called Restoration Aquaculture of Olympia Oysters in Morro Bay. Dr. Kevin Marquez Johnson is a California Sea Grant Extension Specialist based at California Polytechnic State University in San Luis Obispo. His work focuses on integrating genomics, genomics rather, with commercial and restorative aquaculture practices in support of both food production and population recovery in an ever-changing climate. Dr. Johnson began his career at Cuesta Community College before transferring to Calif California State University, Monterey, in 2009. At California State University, Monterey, he developed an interest in applied genomic techniques to understand how climate change will reshape our coastal ecosystems. After his time at California State University, Monterey, he went on to receive a PhD from the University of California at Santa Barbara where he studied the impacts of ocean acidification and warming on pelagic marine invertebrates. In 2017, he began a postdoctoral fellowship at Louisiana State University, where he used genetic and epigenetic sequencing to evaluate the potential for increasing salinity tolerance in the American oyster. Dr. Johnson joined California Sea Grant and Cal Poly SLO in 2020, where he now maintains an active research group of graduate and undergraduate students who are developing methodologies and best management practices for commercially and ecologically relevant species. So it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Kevin Marcus Johnson. Thank you for that introduction. Sorry, I didn't realize that would all get read. I thought it was just rolling on the website. It would have been a little shorter if I had realized that. Are we okay without the microphone? Okay, I think we're all right. Um, so yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you all for coming. I'm really excited to be here and share with you what our lab group has been doing. Um, as was mentioned, I started during the middle of the pandemic 2020, uh, which is kind of a weird time to start anything new. Um, yet here I am, and we were able to get this project off the ground. Um, there's multiple components of it that we're going to walk through. We're thinking about our native Olympia oyster, which is a relatively small, kind of a full-grown adult oyster. Um, you can pass that around and kind of observe it while we ramble on about Sea Grant, because I would imagine most of you have never heard of Sea Grant. So I want to kind of take a step back, because I'm not your classic professor. I'm not a tenure track faculty member at Cal Poly. I'm a research faculty member who has a position with Cal Poly that's shared with California Sea Grant. And so I wanted to kind of give you guys an, an overview of what that program looks like. Um, the Sea Grant program, it's, there's a National Sea Grant College Act that was established in 1966 
that set forth a mandate that every coastal state needs to have a Sea Grant program to provide expertise to industry and policymakers regarding their environment. Um, this is a federal university partnership similar to the USDA land grant that many universities um, work underneath, and it brings science to communities for healthy coasts and healthy economies. Um, right now, we have a network of 33 programs uh, along our, uh, the West Coast, East Coast, Gulf of Mexico, Alaska, Hawaii, uh, the Great Lakes, and we will soon, uh, probably the next uh, omnibus cycle, will be 2026, we're looking to add the Great Salt Lake um, into this uh, network of um, Sea Grant University programs. Um, you can see the East Coast is a little spoiled with their coastline, they have lots. Um, California is so big, we actually have two, so there's a University of Southern California Sea Grant that primarily serves the greater Los Angeles region, and then California Sea Grant, where we serve pretty much the remainder of the state. Um, our, our emphasis is coastal science serving California. So what kind of science can we be delivering that serves the needs either from an economic perspective or a policy perspective of California? And this is a federal state partnership uh, where we get federal funds that have to be matched with state dollars. And so it's buy-in from Ocean Protection Council, from California Water, um, Water Board, all buy-in to help support our program. Um, our funding comes for, through Congress, so um, every congressional budget cycle, there is a line item for the National Sea Grant Program. Almost every president has tried to zero it out, and we have senators on both sides of the aisle. Um, this last cycle was the first time we had a single senator um, abstain from a vote, and that was because it was the senator from Utah who we don't have the, a program in Utah yet, so that's changing. Um, California Sea Grant itself was established in 1973, so we've got these fun new stickers and pens. There's a few up there. Help yourself. It's our 50th anniversary. Uh, so we've been in, in the business for 50 years. We've done work with everything from uh, white abalone, thinking about white abalone recovery, to sturgeon and helping the economies of developing sturgeon aquaculture, um, abalone aquaculture, oyster aquaculture, seaweed aquaculture. We do a lot of different things. Um, and we try to capture a lot of that in our new emblem. Um, so we're everything from helping fishermen do a better job, thinking about um, exclusion sizes of rings to make sure that otters aren't impacted, to uh, helping develop uh, better methodologies for reducing the impact of aquaculture in our nearshore environments. Um, our overall mission from California Sea Grant, we just released our new strategic plan for 2024 to 2027. Um, I had the, uh, what I told I'm supposed to call, the privilege of helping to draft that document, which was not a fun task. Uh, but our mission is to provide the information, tools, training, and relationship needed to conserve California, help California conserve and sustainably protect our coastal and marine environments. Um, we have all, our, all of our extension agents, we're all very passionate about our coast. As, I mean, you're all here, you are too as well, right? Uh, we're speaking in the same area. We, we accomplish this by collaborating with a range of stakeholders and partners um, all from across the realm, from um, users like uh, aquaculture experts to, I work with um, a lot of people in the, um, overseeing the state level aquaculture, what happens in the state and how they're bringing legislation down to direct and control what aquaculture does and doesn't, isn't allowed to do in California. Uh, within Sea Grant, we have a focus areas for our strategic plan. Uh, I'm going to stop start at the bottom. Um, our three topical areas are sustainable fisheries and aquaculture. And so this is a focus on making sure that we're providing the science um, and the knowledge necessary to make sure that our fisheries and our aquaculture practices are sustainable. Uh, we work on projects that address healthy coastal, coastal ecosystems. Um, so this work that I'm going to talk about today falls across both of these areas where we're thinking about restoring ecosystems, maintaining healthy balance in those systems, uh, but also partnering it with um, aquaculture and helping that commercial entity survive. Um, and then we also have resilient communities and, e and economies. Um, these are three main topical areas, uh, but we also maintain a cross-cutting themes 
of um, diversity, equity, inclusion, um, and environmental literacy and workforce development. And both of these top two fast cutting themes are implemented in each of our topical areas. So we have a very broad program. Uh, California Sea Grant operates off of about a $14 million a year budget that again comes down from Congress. Uh, we take those funds and we split it up across four major areas. We provide research grants to um, academic institutions um, to help drive research into directions that will benefit um, either um, at the scale of industry or at policy making. Uh, we maintain many different educational opportunities for undergraduate, graduate, and postgraduate students um, that go from everything from um, having opportunities to do research in graduate school to after graduate school, having opportunities to be placed in um, policy. So they'll go to Sacramento and they will work with um, our state senators. Uh, we send people through the Canals program to Washington, D.C. to work in the Senate. Um, and this is all an opportunity to connect our graduate students who are finishing, who are promising, getting them involved in policy early and getting them connected. Um, we then do a lot of work with communication um, and finally extension. And that's, that's really my wheelhouse um, is the extension world where we're, we work hard to identify um, challenges and opportunities that are currently emerging and help to direct both um, research towards those needs um, in addition to conducting the research ourselves. So we play this nice little balance of kind of orchestrating and bringing together teams of, group, uh, teams of people to address emerging issues in our marine environments. Um, and then we also are able to conduct a lot of that research ourselves as well. Um, we provide a lot of technical re reviews of research and programs and policies to policy makers. So we do make it up to the hill and we do communicate the latest science. And so our goal is to be honest brokers of scientific information and just share, share it how the dice lies. Um, our team, this is our extension team. Uh, there's quite a few of us. Like I said, California Sea Grant is tasked with most of the state. And you can see there's a big gap right in around LA where USC Sea Grant takes over. Um, but we're scattered from Humboldt State, Cal Poly Humboldt. Um, I should say Cal Poly Humboldt. Um, all the way down to Mariska has been running a salmon um, a monitoring program out of Santa Rosa. Um, we have a, no, a marine debris program manager, Tanya Torres, in Oakland. Uh, we work with the Delta Stewards Council um, up in Sacramento. Um, Luke Gardner and myself are, are two, we're the two main aquaculture specialists. Um, Luke's up in Moss Landing, I'm here in Slow. Um, Carrie Culver, she's been doing this a while, she kind of does everything. Um, she's amazing. Uh, her and, Ter and Teresa Talley, our director of extension, um, are pretty fantastic. And this side of the graph, what it showed is we have all sorts of different ways that our positions are funded. So my position is a partnership with Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, where again, every federal dollar that comes in has to have matching funds coming from somewhere. And so Cal Poly San Luis Obispo is able to provide matching funds to support my position um, here at Cal Poly. Which is pretty amazing because that's placed me in the Center for Coastal Marine Sciences here at Cal Poly, which is, if you're not aware of it, which I'm sure a lot of you are, is a fantastic uh, facility and a fantastic group of faculty members that are really focused on getting undergraduate students and graduate students involved in research early. Cal Poly's mo motto is learn by doing, and that's something that I've really taken to. Um, as a Cal State University um, graduate myself, the things that made the difference for my education were those classes where I actually got to do something versus sitting in the classroom and learning. And so Cal Poly is leading that front where we have research vessels like this Radin, where we actually take the marine ecology class out to sea. Um, I teach an aquaculture class where we take our students to the oyster farms in Morro Bay and have them sort, or, sort oysters for half a day and realize that you don't need an undergraduate degree to do this. Um, um, over um, this whole pier, this whole facility has over $12 million in external support across 60 projects since 2011. Um, so this is a, not only an educational facility, but it is a heavy research 
um, group, and it's really awesome to be working with them. Um, the crown jewel, I would say, of the Center for Coastal Marine Science, um, or the baby, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing facility, is our pier in Avila. Um, you can see here, there's rust, there's a lot of upgrades and maintenance that are needed for it. Um, but it's a secure facility in about 40 feet of water. It provides us flowing seawater. Um, we have, uh, you can see back here, we have a crane where we can deploy boats. We have a lower landing, and I'll show you a picture of what we do down there here in a minute. We have um, experiments out on the outside dock where people are looking at the effects of um, low oxygen and uh, warming water on rockfish populations and how rockfish are going to respond. Um, we use oh, that facility to uh, raise um, oysters, so we raise both the commercially produced Pacific oyster, but we also spawn these Olympia oysters. Um, and so here, this is a uh, technician, soon to be graduate student, graduate student, Shannon Baldwin, who's at the back of the room right there, she came. I threatened to make her come up here and talk, she got one more. Um, and then down below the pier at our lower landing, we actually have a system where we can take some of our oysters, we run our experiments, and we're, a lot of our experiments are trying to understand their resiliency to climate change. And we can run those experiments up here, and then let those animals go live in open ocean seawater, um, where it's a very stable, safe environment for them. And we can try to understand how these stresses are gonna impact their survival in a long-term kind of way. Okay. That's Cal Poly and my position here. Any questions? Because I'm going to do this, because I, I don't want to just talk at you all. Anything that anyone wants to talk about? So what are the oysters that are, that are cultured out of more about tips? Most of those are the Pacific oyster. So um, we'll talk about that here in a second. The, the native oyster was depleted pretty quickly. Uh, they're a small oyster. They're really, really tasty. And they were eaten out. Um, What's that? By whom? Uh, the uh, gold rush years, 1849. We did most of our damage then. So people, people, humans, yeah, we ate them. They taste really, really good. <laughs> They're really, really small though, so we ate them fast. And every person, you saw that size of the oysters walking around, right? How many of these do you think it would take to fill you up? Quite a few. Versus the Pacific oyster, which we should have brought the Pacific oyster, because we've got a Pacific oyster at the pier right now. That's our big brooder. He's about 14 inches. Um, so why are you um, cultivating the smaller one when you could get more, more bang for the buck with the large one? Because this is the native one. The larger one comes from Japan. What's that? It doesn't make it better. It doesn't make it better. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that here in a second. Okay. But the populations have declined. And they're at the point now where in a lot of our estuaries are almost extinct. And so a lot of this effort is to bridge commercial aquaculture with uh, the needs in our environments to help them survive, to help bring them back. So it's, it's a partnership is a, what we're trying to get at. Um, so this is a um, photo from the Washington State Historical Society. These are all Olympia oysters. Um, these are about as big as they get. Uh, this is 1909. There's probably a scattering of Pacific oysters in here as well. Um, the early practices, the oysters were so prolific that there was a lot of really bad things that would happen. They would harvest out an entire area. They would select all the big ones for market and take all the small ones and throw them in a the field and let them die. Um, during the 1849 California gold rush, demand for oysters in the boom town of San Francisco creating a thriving trade. They were trading them up and down the coast. Once they depleted them, which was about 1915, they were depleted, they started bringing over eastern oysters from Virginia. They started bringing oysters in from Japan, trying to figure out a way to keep oysters going because the beautiful thing about oysters is you don't have to feed them. Once you have them in the water, they're gonna eat all of the things that are growing in that water naturally. Uh, and so they said while oysters were small, they were prized to their coppery taste and became a traditional food for celebrations of financial success. People would order 200 of them, because you'd take about that many to feed 30 people. When we look at the timeline, this is a very small, I apologize. Um, this is the main graph. So this is a harvest of Olympia oysters from the state of Washington. Basically, the same figure makes, it, makes its way out in California. 
um, we see this is looking at thousands of pounds. So 1850s or so, they were harvesting about 4,000 thousand pounds, so 4 million pounds of oysters. Um, it peaked at somewhere around between 10,000, thousand pounds. So quite a few oysters were harvested, and quickly you see this decline, and basically a flat line. Um, there, we'll talk a little bit about their biology. Yeah. Question? Oh, no, uh, I'm just yeah. trying to focus. Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, that population quickly declined and has had a hard time recovering. And a lot of that has to do with the biology of the organism. Uh, they recruit onto a number of different sur uh, surfaces. So these are Olympia oysters that have recruited into eelgrass. Uh, there's a very tight relationship between the native oysters and eelgrass habitat. If you go up to Willapia Bay, up into uh, Washington, you will find these single oysters literally floating around in the eelgrass that you'll go through because they'll recruit to that eelgrass. They'll get about that big. Oh, oh. They'll get about that big. The eelgrass will die, and then they'll just be on the substrate growing. Uh, and so they're, they're a really important species uh, for not only uh, eelgrass because they're filter feeders, so they're helping clean that water, providing more opportunity for light attenuation through the water column. Uh, but they also, uh, when they start forming up on our rock system, they help stabilize shorelines. Um, so they're really important for shoreline stabilization. And there's a lot of work in San Francisco Bay that has looked at restoring Olympia oysters for the, the purpose of shoreline stabilization. Can we get these organisms to repopulate these areas and literally create a living um, surface because they're encrusting? We've got some really good images of what that encrusting looks like that I'll show you here in a minute. Uh, here in Morro Bay, uh, we know that Olympia oysters were a staple of uh, the Chumash and the Salinidad people. We can go through their um, shell middens, or archaeologists have gone through their shell middens, and they find them. They find them a little bit bigger than this, but not by much. Um, and we're starting to come up with ideas for how to you know, go back and look at the genomics of it, because that's part of my full thing. But we're not going to talk about genetics here. We have a whole other talk we can talk about sometime. Um, early settlers in our area drove over harvesting, um, while changes in water flow drove high sediment. Um, Right, we, this was what the rock used to look like, where it was, there's a name for it, it's a, um, but basically the access to the rock from land was intermittent. On low, low tides you could get there, and the rest of the time you couldn't. And so the estuary flow changed significantly when we put in our breakwater systems. Um, and then we had all of the agriculture, right? There's 48,000, um, I think 48,000 acres of watershed that flowed directly into Morro Bay Estuary. And as we changed our land use over that, it changed the amount of sediment that flows down. And the problem with being a really small oyster like this is that when you get two inches of sediment come downstream, there's nowhere left for you to go. If you're a big Pacific oyster who's eight inches long when you're a year old, you can survive that. And so we have um, in addition to over harvesting, we had changes in our land use and how we managed our upstream systems. And uh, the National Estuary Program, the state park systems have all done a really good job of helping to um, create some remediation for cleaning up that water. But you know, we had that big rain event this year, right? And that water flowed brown for a long time. Um, and there's that is still a function of how we have changed our lands, right? Those estuary systems should act as biofilters, where they're capturing that sediment before it gets all the way into the estuaries. Um, but we've lost a lot of that, and that impacts not only oysters, but eelgrass, um, and then our fish populations that utilize that eelgrass, those eelgrass beds as nursery dams. So, all of that um, led to a 2021 study um, that identified Morro Bay as one of the three top estuaries that was suitable for restoration. And this is small, but they're basically asking, is recruitment limited? Is the Olympia ocean population, is the Olympia oyster population at risk of local extinction? How isolated is the oyster? Is it self safe to eat shellfish in these estuaries? And this was a study that went from Washington to Southern California. 
and our alluvial oysters or any other bivalve currently being farmed in the estuary. So it was the ability of the study uh, authors to answer yes to these that made Morro Bay one of three estuaries on the west coast that I was identified as a prime candidate for restoration of these species. We have clean enough water for shellfish. We have evidence that the recruitment is limited. Um, we have evidence that the population is isolated. The next closest estuary is Elkhorn Slough. That's a long way for an oyster to get. Um, we know it's safe to eat shellfish. Um, regulations allow harvest of these organisms. Um, and, but what we didn't know, that, that, what we didn't know is, is course post mortality of these oysters low? That's a question we don't have an answer to. Um, is there a nearby hatchery? That was a question we don't have an answer to. Is post settlement growth of Olympia oysters high? That was a question we don't have an answer to. And so it was these three questions that drove the Nature Conservancy to reach out to us at Cal Poly and say, hey, can you help us with this? because we've identified Morro Bay as one of the top three estuaries, and we'd like to get something started. And I didn't talk about it, but I had a background in running hatcheries. Um, I, I spent about three years running Eastern Oyster Hatchery down in Grand Isle, Louisiana. We were trying to identify whether or not we could increase. The Bluetooth device is connecting us successfully. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so all that, drove us to develop a handful of projects. The first project was to monitor recruitment of Olympia oysters, right? We got some music. <laughs> <laughs> I had a quick question. Yeah. Um, so you said three, so there was more Bay, Elkhorn, Slough, and what was the third one? So, um, so Elkhorn Slough isn't even on the list. So oh. Morro Bay, uh, Carbon Korea Marsh um, is on that list. And the other one is up in Washington, and I'm blanking on the name of it, but it's a bay in Washington. Um, Elkhorn Slough is close to the list, but what Elkhorn Slough limit lacks is um, there's no other bivalves being cultured in Elkhorn Slough. Um, it's not currently considered safe to eat shellfish out of Elkhorn Slough, um, and regulations do not allow harvest of Olympia oysters out of Elkhorn Slough. So, Again, the study that identified these was trying to use these as benchmarks to identify what makes the most sense for investing in restoration. And so that's where TNC came into play. So our first project um, that was funded by um, a foundation that has donated money to Cal Poly Santa Rosa Creek Foundation um, funded um, students, a handful of students, to place recruitment tiles out through the estuary, which are literally just Home Depot six inch by six inch pearl white tiles, and we hang them on PVC frames, um, and we get recruitment to the bottom side of the tile. Uh, we put these out starting in the summer of 2021, my first summer here, um, and we saw no recruitment. It was really exciting. <laughs> um, helping the students, we decided to identify everything else we could on the tiles because we weren't getting any oysters. Uh, but these are placed from the key pier, north key pier, south key pier, in front of Tidelands Park, and off of Windy Point. And I'll talk in a minute about why we chose those locations. Exciting, oh, last year, 2022 summer, we actually saw recruitment for the first time at those sites. So 2021, we put the tiles out, nothing. 2022, we just said we're doing it again. And we actually, we had identified five Olympia oysters that recruited to our tiles in uh, 2022. So this was really exciting because it's the first time that we we're able to show that the Olympia oysters that are in Morro Bay are at least being somewhat successful in reproducing on their own. So the second part of our project was to actually go out and try to get a census of the population. How many animals are actually in that estuary? Um, and to do this, this was in partnership with the uh, Morro Bay National Estuary Program, uh, where we had both NEP staff members and Cal Poly undergraduates literally scouring the inner tidal on every low tide last summer. And we went from the jetty wall all the way through. We did not miss a single meter. Um, we did 50 meter transects at a time, 
and we looked underneath every rock that we potentially could. Um, these efforts, we identified about 500 oysters in the inner tidal. Uh, not quite zero, not much better, uh, but 500 animals. And we found some really nice hot spots. So here, blue is hot spots. So you can see where one of the spots we put tiles is here, another spot we put tiles is here, the third spot here, and then over near the marina. Um, and we're trying to understand um, by putting in recruitment tiles where we see adults, are they recruiting back to those same areas? Um, and we saw, we found, like I said, about 500. Uh, we know these animals can go to a depth of about 30 feet. So what we haven't been able to survey yet is anything below about a negative 0.5 tide. Um, and that's gonna be some of our future directions that uh, Shannon in the back is gonna be leading up on. Uh, but this was really exciting because we actually saw that the last study that actually looked was in 2009 They spent two hours surveying the estuary and they found zero and since 2009 the consensus is that there are that Olympia oysters are absent from our estuary um, And I came in, in my position in 2020 TNC called me the first thing I went to I went to the oyster groves. I said George Neal Are there native oysters in this estuary? And they both, without even blinking, said, of course there are. They're right over there. And from their storefront, they were able to point me down to where Olympia oysters were. And that got the ball going. It's like, okay, well, we need to better understand what this population is before we go out and try to do restoration of a population that we think is extinct, but is actually present. And so that's been the impetus for a lot of this work, is trying to just understand the distribution that is right now in our estuary. So together, points one and two show us that they are present and that they are actively reproducing, even if it's just a small little bit in our estuary. Um, however, our, our three years of monitoring have only identified five, and this suggests that recruitment is still limited. That even though there are some, there's not enough um, to really successfully repopulate the estuary. And a lot of that is because uh, the life cycle of these organisms. So our third project is using restorative aquaculture in Morro Bay. Uh, restorative aquaculture is different than conservation aquaculture, and it's different than restoration. So restorative aquaculture is, I think I have it in here, is a, a res restoration approach where we cultivate native species in commercial aquaculture here. Um, these little oysters, they're slow growers. They're gonna take three years in, in an oyster bag to be able to reach market size. During that three years, these organisms can start reproducing at, after about a year and a half. And they will, during the summer months, from about mid-April to so about right now, to October, every 30 days, they're able to release babies. So if you imagine having a thousand of these in an oyster bag on a farm, and they're able to reproduce over and over again for three summers before they're harvested. That's a lot of potential seed, oysters, that can be distributed through the estuary, allowing for the species to repopulate zones that it's not currently at, without ever having to do anything more than partner with our commercial growers who are trying to make a living in that back bay. Uh, and so why might this work? One of the reasons is they have a unique reproductive life cycle. Um, and it's unique because the males release sperm into the water column, the females uh, intake that sperm, they fertilize their egg inside their shell, fertilize their egg, so an individual about this size will have about 250,000 eggs in her, fertilize those embryo eggs inside the shell, and then will brood them for about 14 days. I've got some images of it. So, oh that is plenty of it. Um, so what we do is we take, we took 20 adults and we put them in a little bucket and we simulated spring coming. We raised the temperature one degree Celsius a week up to about 18 degrees Celsius. And after about four weeks of them being at 18 degrees Celsius, they released these little larvae. So they get a Play again. Yeah. And so this is a recently released swimming Olympia oyster. 
So after spending two weeks in the chamber of the, of the mother, she releases these, these uh, embryos or these larvae that are able to swim around. And you can see that one's trying to eat. You kind of think of them as like swimming Roombas. They're just like cruising around, slurping up all the microalgae they can find. About two weeks later, they reach this late developmental stage, which the lighting's a little bad, but right here you can kind of see a little black dot. That's called an eye spot. And it's actually a visual, it's a visual um, receptor that they have. And they also develop a foot, which is a sensing organism where they're literally reaching out, pacing for calcium carbonate. Because they want to settle on calcium carbonate or other biological or like uh, eel grass. You find them something to set. Um, so here we give them small pieces of shell, ground up oyster shell. And this is an individual of an eyed larvae among shell. Um, we give them this sediment uh, material for 72 hours and they will set and become a single oyster like this after 72 hours. And this is really cool. Um, right here, you can actually see its gill. It's already formed its gill. Um, and it has metamorphosized from being a swimming organism to now being a sessile organism. And so we think of these oysters a lot like we would think of plants because they have a pelagic dispersal phase. So a phase that the individuals get spread out and allowed to be carried with the currents. And then at some point, they're gonna find a forever home and set and become this hard rock um, and never move again. And so because of that, they have a lot of unique adaptations. They produce a lot of eggs, 250,000 at a time for each female. When a female is, has fertilized their, her eggs, uh, and as she's brooding, actively brooding those individuals to get them to develop, she's at the same time switching from being a female to being a male. And she's actually putting on sperm and developing sperm. And the individual that had been a male is actually growing eggs. And so that next 30 days later after um, the spawn event, the male is ready to go and will release sperm. Um, and what had been a male will now be a female with eggs that can accept that sperm. Um, and this is an evolutionary process that has evolved that is really common in oyster species because they form these reefs. And so you could imagine a healthy oyster reef this size would have 1,000, 2,000 oysters on it. And it's a way to distribute who you reproduce with because you're continually swapping back whether you're male or you're female. Every reproductive cycle is doing that switch. So that continues? Yeah. They keep flipping? They keep flipping back and forth. And that's some of our questions that we have is, how long does that plasticity last? And some of the, the benefits of the research that we're doing where we're producing so many is we can actually kind of study some of that. Um, and we can start to look closer by tagging individuals and asking, okay, over the course of a summer, how many times does this individual spawn as a male versus how many times does it spawn as a female? It's very interesting questions that we don't have all the answers to, but the best, our best knowledge suggests that every cycle they're swapping back and forth and they don't stop until they die, which is around 12 to 16 years. And do they, as they age, do they have Ten-year-old produce a lot more sperm and eggs than a three-year-old. Yep, yep. They max out at around 250,000 eggs, um, 250,000, 300,000, which is tiny. So those big Pacific oysters, those max out at like 250 million. So it's very hot. <laughs> so with such a small population of oysters in the estuary. Um, is there concerns about the genetic diversity of the oysters? 100%, yeah. So the whole section that I'm not talking about is our genome sequencing. So our group, uh, we resequenced the genome just uh, six months ago. We've assembled a brand new genome that's a chromosome level. So we have identified the 10 major chromosomes that are in the oyster genome. And we're able to, we're gonna go back through and sequence, we actually, we have sequence data at Idaho State right now being Idaho State being sequenced right now for our brood stock that we used in our first year of sequencing to get an idea of how genetically diverse is the brood stock we use. Um, and then the second thing we can do as we start to see recruitment in future years because of our efforts, we'll actually be able to trace back, is this individual that's recruiting, is this an offspring from our hatchery or is this a wild individual? 
And we'll actually be able to tease that apart because of our genomic data. Um, and again, DNC is hunting a lot of this because there's concern about genetic diversity. And should we actually be bringing animals from Elkhorn and breeding them with more of a to increase that genetic diversity? Um, those are, so I have another graduate student who's doing comparisons between the two populations to better understand, should we be doing that? Is that gonna, you know, is there downside to doing that? Or is it gonna just be more genetic diversity for our population, and therefore probably something we should be able to consider? Great question. Yeah. Under the microscope, when you're looking at shelled villager larvae, yeah. and you have all these larvae coming in with the tides as well as the native clams, how do you distinguish? It's a with the oyster, are you doing it at the genetic level? Uh, so we're only sampling them when they set. So when they metamorphosize onto our tile, and then they have some very unique characteristics. Um, if I had, I don't think I have an image of it, but the, um, when they, so this is set on a single, but it sets on a tile, you get this really unique bubble. It looks like a little marble at the edge, at the end of the oyster, and it's very, very characteristic of Olympia oysters. Um, and so there are ways, once they set, to really be able to differentiate them. In the water column, you have to use sequencing. You have to go in, and what we would end up doing is doing a metagenomic sequencing, where we would basically take a water sample, grind it all up, extract the DNA, sequence that, and then ask how many uh, DNA molecules map back to the Olympia oyster genome. And we can use that as a proxy to determine how many potential larvae were in that sample of water. We're not doing that at the moment, but that's how you would get at that. Um, okay, so the next part of our project is taking these juveniles, so these are now Olympia oysters that we've set, um, and then Shannon tagged um, individually with little, they're actually uh, tags that are made for honeybees. So they make these tags and you can uh, tag your queen honeybees and we use them to tag our oysters. And so we use um, a really strong super glue. Um, I think it is, which one did we use? That's, yeah, I think it was Loctite. <laughs> and we glue them onto the shell and then we can put them into a, an oyster, a commercial oyster basket. So you can see here's uh, about 150 Olympia oysters have been placed in a basket along with a temperature logger. So we can get an idea of the environment that those animals are in. Um, and then we partnered with both uh, George Trevelyan from Grassy Bar Oyster Company and Neil Maloney with Mora Bay Oyster Company. And we're putting animals out on both their farms to try to understand the spatial distribution of survivorship and growth of Olympia oysters in the estuary. Um, and again, we're really, really fortunate that we have growers, aquaculture growers like George and Neil who really, really care about their ecosystem that they work in. They, they spend every day on the water, looking at it, thinking about it, trying to better grow an oyster. They care about their habitat. They want it as clean as possible. And they are both completely on board with utilizing some of their space, not for commercial gain, but for restorative practices. Um, we hope one day they'll be able to sell these, but right now the only permit is to grow them, to track how they grow, and how recruitment is affected by them. Uh, the, third, the second part of this project is to monitor the growth, survival, and recruitment for the next three years. Uh, so this is the same individuals uh, from this slide. Uh, this was about four months later in the estuary, and they're quite a bit bigger already. Uh, and so again, Shannon, I didn't know she was gonna be here. Uh, she's, she's featured a lot. Uh, she's been my technician, um, making sure that this stuff actually happens because I'm too busy. Uh, and she's going to she's starting with her master's program this fall, where uh, we'll be looking at growth and survival of these individuals for three years, um, in addition to maintaining our tiles at the same sites. So we can actually have, a, before any Olympia oysters have been put into the estuary, we know what kind of recruitment we saw over time. And now that we have them in the estuary, we can track recruitment to see, did we increase the amount of recruitment that we see in our estuary? Um, and our future steps are to expand the monitoring to subtitle zones. So again, they go deep. So we don't know right now how deep those animals, if there's any animals that's less than about a, maybe a point, maybe 0.5. 
um, has, and we think there are. Um, and so Shannon's going to be doing a lot of dive surveys in the estuary to try to find those. Uh, we've been setting uh, Olympic oasis on those same tiles in the lab, and so you can kind of see what a natural set of Olympic oasis looks like. And then Shannon can take these and individually label them and put them out at our five different sites in the estuary and ask, if you're a juvenile oyster that lands in this area, would you survive? Would you be able to make it? And again, this is all trying to develop knowledge so that if our passive restorative aquaculture practices don't work and we have to move towards a more aggressive restoration approach, where do we focus our efforts? Because you're not going to do the whole estuary. And so this can identify, well, you don't want to do it here because conditions cause all of these individuals to die. Uh, but we can identify zones in the estuary that would be really, really uh, good spots to go. Um, so that's all I got for you guys today. Um, this work is uh, funded from the Nature Conservancy and Center of the Creek Foundation uh, with amazing collaborators with the National Estuary Program, uh, Baron Garrity. Uh, John Alyssa Wilson at uh, California the Nature Conservancy, George Trevelyan from Grassy Bar, Neil Maloney with Moore Bay Oyster Company, a handful of students over oh, the Cal Poly Pier staff is right here, Tom Lennon, and Jason Felton, who basically make sure that the pier continues to run and function. And none of this would be possible without them. And my favorite oyster soaker, my two year old daughter. With that, happy to answer more questions. Can you just clarify that all the oysters that you're working with that you're putting out, those all originally came from Boro Bay. There's zero introduction from anywhere else at this point. At this point, yes. All point, so we and we produced, last year we produced about 15,000 baby oysters from 20 adults. Yeah. What, if anything, do we know about the ability the Olympia oyster hybridized with the Pacific oysters? No. no. Um, so the Pacific oyster has a different reproductive um, strategy uh, where they are both broadcast spawners, so male, uh, uh, it can sperm both get released into the water column um, and fertilize out there. They're also very different um, all the way back. Uh, yeah, they're very differentiated. Yeah. 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 Do you have any hypothesis of why they started to come back? I mean, it was it died down significantly for like 40 years, yeah. 50 years. Yeah. Is there a reason they can come back? So in Morro Bay, we think the reason they're coming back is the work that National Estuary Program and the State Parks have done to clean up our upstream watersheds. So that the water that's coming in is cleaner than it used to be. Uh, there was a lot of work to get cattle out of our streams to set up barriers so that cows aren't in those streams. Because there's one thing to have the, you know, the defecation from the cattle, but it's really more how they turn and they, they basically till that soil. And then when you get these big water events, you get way more mud flushing down. Um, there's also, if you drive past Morro Bay, you can see all that wetland has been restored. And uh, I think the uh, Conservation Corps is back there a lot. Um, doing planting and cleaning all that up, and all of that is having a positive influence on water quality in our estuary. And then there's the subtitle population that we don't know their extent. We don't know how, how many subtitle energy oysters there are. And so those populations are likely kind of basically our, uh, our brood stock that are re repopulating the intertidal zones. Um, there's a lot of things that are restricting them, we think. Uh, there is not native uh, oyster drills that will drill oyster shells and eat them um, that are now present in basically all of our west coast waters. Um, there's invasive crabs uh, that are basically mi minimizing the populations in those intertidal regions. Um, so there's a lot that plays into it, but we think one of the main reasons is improving water quality um, overall. Speaking of water quality, with restoring a healthy population Yeah, an adult, an adult oyster can filter about 50 gallons of seawater a day. Um, and so if you imagine us having, going from 500 oysters in the estuary to something more healthy, like 50,000 oysters, you can easily see how much more water that they're filtering. They're eating phytoplankton, they're eating detritus, 
they're pulling all of that out of the water and filtering it. So it's going to have downstream effects on uh, the ability for eelgrass to repopulate as well because you're going to have more uh, light attenuation through the water column. And they see that at the oyster farms where they have off-bottom oyster bags. They see large eelgrass metals popping up around them because the oysters that they're raising are biological filters. And they're just filtering out that water, increasing water clarity, allowing the eelgrass to grow a little deeper. I think for decades I've thought, I don't know where I heard it or learned it from, that they were extinct in Norway. So, before that 2009 survey with no results, is there any published research of their last known occurrence? In the um, late 80s, early 90s. There was a there was reports, but it wasn't very well documented. But they were here. It was more personal communication that Olympia oysters were found in Morro Bay. Uh, the Polson Group did a study from San Diego to British Columbia, and you know it was a small team of four people. Um, and they spent two hours in each estuary. And they spent, we go back to my mark. Give me animations. They spent their whole two hours right here. That was in the 90s. That was in the 90s. No, 2009. That oh, was 2009. Okay. And they're still yeah, not there. We well, go back to that same zone. They're not there. The oyster farmers that told you, yes, they're here, do they give you feedback how long they've known they've been here? Um, well, both growers are relatively new to the area. Um, but they've both known about them for as long as they've been here. And again, these are guys that are just on the water every day working in that zone. You can talk to, uh, got a buddy who is a commercial uh, albacore fisherman in Morro Bay, Alan, talk to him. And he was like, oh, are those those guys that foul up on the bottom of my boat? Yeah, that's them. <laughs> um, and so there's, you know, the more people you talk to that are actually working on our waterfronts, and that's what I love about my job, right? I'm extension. I, I talk with industry members across the board. When you start talking to people that are actually on the ground and not just in an office, um, you get a lot of real information from them. You get a lot of unique insights. And so that's when TNC came back and said, hey, we want to do restoration. We're going to bring animals down from Humble. I was like, well, let's hold on and figure out what's actually happening. And when, at first, people I went and talked to were the oyster growers. And they were like, no, no, they're here. They're here. They're just not very many. Uh, my last question, have there ever been any surveys done in Port San Luis? some of the rocky outcrops? Um, no, and primarily the reason why we wouldn't look for them there is it's way too open ocean. They're an estuary and species. They outcompete everyone. So looking at this map, they, they peter off once you start getting the fresh, the salt water. Once you lose that effect of fresh water input, they're not able to compete for space with some of your other um, bigger bivalves and oyster drills and barnacles. You'll get a recruitment of barnacles that'll just cover up your entire rock. And a mussel can sneak its way in there. But these small Olympia oysters that are so slow growing, they're not they're not able to compete, we don't think. Any honors? Yeah. Oh otters would love you guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah otters even for sure. No question. Uh, the life cycles. You said they were recruiting, like, like invite them over, like, come on over, here's our tiles, but you want to yeah. settle down. Like, like, yeah, so it's, those are synonyms, for sure. So the recruitment is what we use when we're talking about, we put out a substrate, and we're hoping to see them come that'd in. That'd be like your white tile. That's, like, that's, that's yeah, our white tile. That's part of it. No, it's just, it's just a tile. Just a um, and so that's recruitment. That's where we passively put something out, and we're asking, is it recruiting to that substrate? They like it. 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 They like
where they can find where your files or field grass or about 30 days. Okay. So it's a pretty long time. Um, and you know, going back, I'm gonna take back my statement about Fort San Luis. No one's looked. Um, but I was up and doing some surveys for monkey face purplebacks not too long ago up at San Sinia, and we came across an Olympia oyster in the inner paddock, um, which was a little bit mind blown. But again, they're trying to reach these different estuaries, and there's some freshwater inputs that I wonder used to maybe they used to house Olympia oysters, or there's enough freshwater still coming in through some of those creeks to create a plume of fresh freshened water that allows them to out compete. How are you going to protect the oysters that you're growing from the salt? Oh, the ones on the farm are in bags. Um, the other ones that Shannon's going to put out on tiles, they're not going to get protected. It's going to be one of the, one of the challenges. Yeah. <laughs> okay, my other question is um, as to the outcome. Yes. So is there any Yeah, so California Sea Grant, we funded a bunch of work with the White Abalone Program, restoration program that's now being run out of UC Davis, the Dega Marine Labs. Um, we have three of our extension folks who are involved in that process, project right now, where we've actually been raising, we have more white abalone in captivity than there are in the wild right now. And just last summer, they did the first outplant in Southern California of white abalone that were raised in lab, and they put them out into the field to see if they'll survive. Yeah. And then we have ongoing conversations around black abalone populations. Um, so uh, there's a gentleman, John Steinbeck, famous name, but he's also pretty famous around our area, uh, who's still actively involved um, with some of that work. And he's helping to organize, I'm part of that working group, to talk about what are the next steps to help black abalone recovery in this area. There's some issues. Um, there's, if people try to spawn and raise that black abalone in hatcheries since the 70s, they had red abalone. Uh, they tried to spawn and raise them in hatcheries since the 70s. There's been two groups that have each done it once, and neither of them was ever able to do it again a second time. If I did, we wouldn't have problems. <laughs> um, <laughs> they just they can't get them to, re to, to release their, don't, their gametes. Uh, so they're the same, they're, they're uh, broadcast spawners. So the males release eggs, the males release sperm, the females release eggs, and those have to find each other in the water column. There's some new technology that is being developed. So we funded work up at uh, Davis to develop ultrasound technology for abalone. So now we can take an abalone, flip it over, take an ultrasound and actually assess whether or not that female is grabbed. Does she have a lot of eggs? Is she actually gonna spawn if we put them in the spawning tank? Um, and to spawn them, we kind of just give them a little bit of a bath of hydrogen peroxide for about two minutes and then put them back in fresh seawater. And for whatever reason, that stresses them out enough to start spawning. Um, but we haven't been able to crack that with black abalone. And so there's a lot of ongoing work. You see Santa Cruz, Keep it, Monday's group up there is leading a lot of that work to try to better understand can we take these new technologies, these new approaches, and apply it to black abalone. Um, and a lot of interest in the area around Diablo, right? That's a fully protected area. There are some pretty healthy black abalone populations if you actually go in there and survey. Um, and so what can be done if we can get methods for hatchery um, application, can we actually start to do some of that? But until we get those methods worked out, no one's bringing black abalone from the wild to try. Um, so there's only a handful of individuals that have been in captivity for a long time that are being used for this. this those animals, and there was a mudslide in Garapada, North Big Sur, about a year and a half ago. And they went and rescued the, Olympia, the, the black abalone that were now all of a sudden out of the water and had no chance of getting back into the water. They went and brought those back, and those are now in a holding facility uh, UC Santa Cruz, where they're doing a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. So real quick, um, uh, I thought I heard you say that 1915 was the date where the uh, Pacific Oyster was introduced to the area. Is that, is that I'd always thought it was sometime during the 1930s. Or, do you know what the history of the introduction of the Pacific to Oyster to, to, to Morro Bay specifically? No, I don't. I, I don't have that date on. Okay. 
Is there any place where Olympia oysters are grown and harvested? Yes, commercially? California. Uh, Hog Island up in Hamala Bay is one of our partners that we work with closely. Hog Island Oyster Company. Oh, yeah. So I work closely. We actually another project with this that we didn't talk about is we're doing paired studies of growth rates between Morro Bay, El Corn Slough, and Tamala Bay, and that's in partnership with Hog Island Oyster Company. And so last year they did their first sell of California raised Olympia oysters. Um, they're, they've got a small batch that they're going to do another round of marketing this coming in summer, but they'll try to push some out. There's a handful of companies up in Washington that still produce them. Um, they're a specialty oyster, right? They're really small. So you you know you're and you're spending three dollars for an oyster that big. So you know it takes some marketing, um, but a lot of it is around this restorative aquaculture front, where you know we're raising these not because it's the biggest oyster, but because it's a really unique flavor, um, and there's an ecosystem service benefit to raising the native species. Tiles, have you uh, tested with different types of material to see what's more receptive to the oysters? Yeah, so we've gone back and forth between um, terracotta tiles or white ceramic tiles. Um, in the lab, we, have, we also tested just oyster shell, dangling oyster shell in. Our collaborators of uh, Elkhorn Slough also use paper clam, so those big clam shells that you'll find, not the pismo clam, but the wider, flatter, estuary paper clams. Um, it seems to us that they actually recruit the tiles best. There's some nuances to why I think that's happening. Just like it. <laughs> uh, well, it's, it's an even surface, um, and then we stack those tiles on top of each other. And um, if, you're, if you're in the world of the larvae, and you're this tiny thing getting blown away by massive currents, you're looking for areas that have uh, basically resistance to those currents, and it's, it's called Reynolds numbers. You can get into like the, the hydrodynamics of what's happening, but in these short, small confined spaces, the turbulence slows down. And so those animals are able to find these crevices, and then they're a little bit protected and have that time to do that metamorphosis. Um, and so I think the, the way that we set our tiles is a little bit more beneficial to that process. Yeah, they're just they're um, they're Home Depot ceramic tiles. <laughs> yeah, they're, you buy them. It's a white tile, six inch by six inch tile that you get for your your kitchen. And we drill a hole in it. Use some uh, galvanized. Uh, steel um, bolts that are really long, and we use a quarter inch that actually fit on the bolt, and then we use um, a half inch, which won't fit on the bolt, and that's our spacer. <laughs> and we sandwich them together. <laughs> yes, they're very good. <laughs> My collaborator is a hog island throw. <laughs> Said. Your first, your first slide. Oh, oh, yes, 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 yes. Yeah. 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 They're funny. They're cool little animals. We have a lot of good animals here. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.